So let's bring her up. Data artist, Lori Frick. Have you ever thought about what's known about you? Not just what's known about you online, right? In Google, you've Googled yourself, you know what you've posted, you know, all those pictures on Instagram, right? Everything that's out there. But everything that's known about you, every time you drive through the Easy Pass, you pick up a prescription at CVS, every time you buy something on Amazon, every movie you've ever seen on Netflix, you start really, you know, thinking about, I make work out of measurements, out of self-tracking data, and about a year ago I started making a list, and I scored it from one to five, I put it in Excel, and I got way past 100 things. And every few days I'd think about something else that was known about me. You know, about a week ago I figured out um, Amazon knows how fast I read a book because of my Kindle. Right, I'd walk into Home Depot, right, to return something, and they wave away the receipt and just, you know, swipe your card, and they know exactly what I bought. I realized that Fitbit can identify me from my gait, right? There's an accelerometer, and I'm 100% identifiable by how I walk. You know, so as I start describing this, does it start to make you a little uncomfortable? <laughs> what I started to realize was that this added up to a picture of me, this part of me that's hidden, this part of me that I don't notice or see, that was maybe richer and more complex and more interesting than I could even remember about myself. And so, you know, while you might think, you know, all this personal data that's being collected about you makes you vaguely uncomfortable, don't let me think about it, I, I, I'm here today to talk you into wanting more. I'm a data artist. Um, I make large installations and objects out of self-tracking data. And I didn't always do this. I, um, I started my life in high tech. I went to school as an engineer. Um, I worked for these big computer companies and eventually I, you know, I got promoted and ran big chunks of them. Uh, I even started um, a, a company here in Austin. I co-founded a, a mobile telecom company. And 10 years ago I quit. You can quit. <laughs> and, um, and went back to grad school and got an MFA and I started to figure out how to be an artist. And what's sort of curious is that everything that you do, I mean, you, know, you don't hide. All that stuff comes back. Everything, you'd be amazed. It all comes back to play, you'll see. So I'm gonna tell you the story about um, kind of how I got to here and this whole data thing. It was four years ago. <coughs> And it all started with time. I'd had this sense that something had changed. Time felt more fragmented. It felt like it was slivered in little bits. And there was a writer, Linda Stone, and she described it as continual partial attention. And I, I'd, been, I'd been making pieces based on um, imagined time you know, little bits of time forward, backward, and I always thought a perfect painting was like 24 hours. The big quiet areas where you slept and the little intense bits. And I thought, oh, I really want to study this, I should measure it. And so I started trying to figure out how to actually measure my time for real, not imagining it. And it is so hard. So I Googled it and I found Ben Lipkowitz, who'd been measuring his time online 24 hours a day, minute by minute for years. And it was like, holy shit, his stuff looks like mine. I mean, I was sort of blown away. And I wasn't, I was, you know, went, rather than being intimidated, I just, I literally, I scraped it. I pulled it all down and I started to make drawings from it. And I literally drew from his data about time. And I reorganized it, like 24 hours, and I put all the sleep parts together. And, um, but I wanted to measure something of, of me. And because I'd been in tech and I'd worked on new consumer products, I knew that sensors were getting small and the ability to measure ourselves was gonna be easy, right? It's gonna be the clothes we wear. There's this whole category of ingestibles, stuff that you swallow that will measure you. Um, wearables, everything was gonna be simple and it's gonna be 
automatically captured ambiently, invisibly about you. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll just you know, live in the future a little bit and try to find things that are easy to measure because it's, it's only going to get easier. And the very first thing I found, voila, was a Zio. It is this thing that measures your sleep. Very, I mean, not, it's not like an iPhone you put under your pillow and it you know, figures out when you roll over. This was actually an EEG sensor you wear on your forehead and it actually measures your brain waves very accurately, your sleep state, awake state, right, exactly. And I started to see what my sleep was like. Every single one of those vertical bars is a night of sleep. And at first it was like, wow, you know, you, sleeping is a lot like waking. These little five and 10 minute bursts. But the thing that really struck me was it was the first time I could really see this part of me I'd never seen, this hidden part, this part when you sleep. I mean, you go to bed, you wake up in the morning, it's like, what happened in between? And it, you know, I, it, was, it was different than I pictured. It was a chance to see something of myself I didn't really, I hadn't really seen. And I, I I'd always thought I was a really good sleeper. <laughs> I mean, that was sort of the story I told myself. You know, you go to bed eight hours later, you, you, you might be lying there for eight hours, but you're not getting eight hours of sleep. And, and so it, it gave me this insight or this moment to see myself that I'd never really understood. I went, wow. So I've made works from it. And if you take a look here, so there's, I kind of created this rule system, right? So the dark red <laughs> is deep sleep. The yellow is REM sleep. And I took all the light sleep and I folded it up because light sleep is really just trash sleep. And I put all this um, into a show that went um, in, in LA. And it was really a pivotal moment. It got reviewed, it got blogged about, it got into a scientist magazine. I mean, it really got out there. And um, the head of Zio found me and goes, what can we do to help? <laughs> He's like, yeah, what can I do to help you, Lori? So I said, give me more data. And he sent me, um, data from a bunch of people that work there anonymously. And it was the first chance I got to compare my sleep with a bunch of other people's. Right, so you can see I tipped it the other way. And I realized that sleep patterns, was, it was very identifiable, almost like a fingerprint. Really unique and specific to you. You see, so I'm the one, purple is the really good stuff. Purple is deep sleep. And you can see this poor guy down, right, on the right. If you can see, he's the, all that orange is when he's waking up. And it was right about this time, I, um, I didn't want to be the only one that was jumping into bed every night with that thing strapped around my forehead. So I got one of these for my husband. <laughs> and um, he, you know, he always thought he was a terrible sleeper. And it turns out his sleep swings wildly. He's either really good, actually he's mostly really good or sometimes really terrible, versus my sleep, which was like, I was just like hanging on by my fingernails, like hardly getting enough. And I realized there was something very insightful about these measurements, about you, or about me, my husband. There was something there. And um, I thought I should, you know, it was right at this moment that I wanted to measure more and I met Steve Dean who runs the quantified self for New York. And he said, Laurie, come show your sleep patterns and talk about your art. And that's, I'm, I found my people. I even met Ben Lipkowitz. I, you know, as an artist, a lot of my <coughs> friends think I'm a little too organized. You know, I'm, um, everything has its place. All the mugs are in the cupboard, the handles go the same way. My house is, people have been, it's really neat. Um, <laughs> But these were my people. And everything I learned about self-tracking came from the quantified self. Um, by the way, my husband and I run the quantified self for Austin. We do a meetup group, so look online. And I started adding to my regimen and looking for everything that I could measure that was this idea of living in the future that was really easy, that was really automatic. So I got a Wything scale, you step on it, and it Wi-Fi's your weight every day. I turned on manic time on my laptop that keeps track of everything you do online. You'd be shocked in the morning, click, 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 click. 
it's seconds. It's if you actually go back and look at what you click on during a day and look at what your time online looks like, it's like it really is this little. I um, I did my 23andMe. I got a Fitbit. Anything that was really easy, and I decided I would just really pay attention. This is what you know. It's one of the things that an artist has a, an advantage over a scientist. You write a scientist has to do a big you know big sample size, double blind, but an artist can really just pay attention to themselves and really notice. I mean, it's almost what an artist's job is. And um, I have this kind of fantasy. And this is, I mean, this is true through history, is that sometimes an artist can anticipate a scientific breakthrough because they notice something that's true and real. It's my secret hope. And the very first thing I noticed was the Zio in the morning asked me, how did I sleep? And I thought, it's like a mechanical mom. <laughs> Honey, how'd you sleep? And I really started to see um, the, how reassuring it was. And the Fitbit, you know, the recognition I got from my Fitbit when I went over 10,000 steps in a day, or the rhythm of weighing myself and sort of seeing what had consequences. That chocolate bar matters. And there was just this sense of um, comfort and reassurance. And these are coming from inanimate devices. And I thought, there really is something here. And I started to study patterns in the data. Right, these are things that you sort of do un unconsciously, these hidden patterns, the things that, you, that are innate. And I thought it's almost like a neural Fibonacci sequence, that you're looking at patterns of you that are somehow recognizable. They feel human. It's got a familiarity to it, but you don't actually understand why. And I let go a little bit of trying to find cause and effect. Uh, you know, at one point I thought I could somehow connect how much I walked, to what did I weigh, to how much I sleep. It, humans are really noisy data objects. It's hard to understand. But, I, but it got me to really look at the patterns, the actual patterns in the data, and start to see them just as portraits, data portraits, portraits of us. OK, pay attention. And I started to then visualize this and put them, right, so I'd make and then put them into large scale pieces and started to imagine what would this be like if they were 3D printed or laser cut or really large scale, almost like intelligent wallpaper. We tend to repeat patterns. We go the same places a lot. So as we travel through a city, we repeat, we retrace our steps. There's a familiarity to it. It's almost like muscle memory. It's like where you go has a, has a sense of memory as you see it. And my studio was filled with these cut and drawn patterns, and I liked it. So for months, my studio was filled with all this cut, patterned, and it felt reassuring. It felt comforting. It felt like it was me. It felt like it reflected me. And I thought, well, what? what, if, what if this is a way to see your hidden patterns? What if everybody could see their patterns this way? Right? You track your behavior, you measure yourself, you reflect it back to yourself. You know, is it, is it a shortcut to mindfulness? What if this is a quick and dirty way to boost your immune system? And, and along the way, people, um, people were buying these. I'm making them, people are bringing them home. They're the gallery shows, art fair. They're putting them in their bedrooms. I've seen them in lobbies, they've gone in. Living, I mean, it's like pe people were really responding, and um, usually it was my data. But in this ins instance, this is 1323, it's in their lobby, and it's the chat metadata from their whole team, the developers and designers and how they interact. So it's almost a data portrait of a company. And somehow I thought art makes data sticky. It gets you to look. And I realize these patterns mean something to me, but maybe they mean something to other people as well. And I started to look at this idea, the experiment with giving these patterns, and we're working on an iPhone app. No pressure, Matt. We're, <laughs> we're um, 1323 is working on it. Uh, to turn these rules and this rule system into an algorithm that actually right, 
watches your behavior of how you move through a city and create patterns from that. Um, I'm signing up beta testers in about a month, so I put little cards up here to remind you if you're interested, or if you just want to get notified when it launches, which is a couple months, um, it's going to be free. It's, it, it is. It's like an experiment. It's like the art. And so um, I created a splash screen for my early launch. You know, and it was about, a, you know, it really wasn't, I've worked on this for years, and it really wasn't that long ago, and I thought, why am I doing this? A shrink would go crazy. Lori, you're putting all these devices on you to measure yourself. What do you think you're doing? And I thought, you're trying to figure out who you are. Who am I? And then I, th I thought, you know, I'm using the you know, I'm using devices to measure my behavior. And I thought, well, maybe this isn't so different than what we all do. I completely changed jobs. And maybe you move apartments, you get a new job, you change girlfriends, you write a new boyfriend. Maybe we're always using external means to figure out who we are. Am I going to like this new city better? Does this set of friends like me? I mean, we're always looking for ways externally to figure out who we are. And I thought maybe the whole point of this is to somehow understand this hidden part of us. Reveal some part of us that's hard to see. You know, there is, there is something about our personalities that's kind of innate. It's formed when we're children. And it's really hard to see ourselves. That part of us that our friends get to see, the part of us that we don't know, that hidden part of us. And maybe the whole point of all of this data tracking is to understand some part of us that we don't know, that other self. Imagine what would be possible if we had every bit of data about ourselves. What would those patterns be? You know, it, can you see it as, you know, massively unpleasant or, po you know, or possibly wildly appealing? What if privacy and all this anxiety we have completely takes a different turn? And it's really about everything that gets tracked about us turns into, who am I? Who am I? I mean, really, like, I mean, it's like, and what can I be? Who am I and what can I be? Am I up? Am I down? Am I on? Am I off? Do I have my mojo today? I've, I've become so curious lately about this ability for data to predict behavior. There's researchers that are um, analyzing Twitter feeds and figuring out who's going to get postpartum depression. There's a team at Cornell looking at your email and figuring out uh, by your circle of friends and your speed of email response if you're going to be depressed. It's, um, it's, it's, such a, it's such a compelling possibility to me. And so when people talk about the quantified self or they talk about data or self-tracking, it always gets described as fitness and health. And I don't think that's what it's going to turn out to be. I think it's about identity. Who am I? Who am I going to be? The words we use, the terms we suit, you know, everything I search online, my glucose <coughs> level, my biomarkers, um, my back posture, you know, everything that's innate, that's hidden, that I don't notice, the things that make us feel natural and mysterious, we can choose to leave it hidden or we could embrace it. If, if, if data is the way that we're going to figure out who we are, why are we running from it? You can decide not to hide. You know, you stop and think, okay, is this, you know, you're sort of going, all right, I'm, I'm right at the end here, and you've, you know, you decide data tracking, everything that's known about me, is it m massively unpleasant or possibly irresistible? There's a big existential idea here, right, that we add up to everything that's measured about us. 
But I actually like to think, you know, I'm a very pragmatic, I like to think of it as a very simple data tracking is going to figure out for me, well, what am I going to be like tomorrow? Who am I? So I will say, don't hide, go get more. Thank you.